On Monday, April the 27th, 1958, Cliff Richard, the star of the hit TV show Oh Boy, headlined an evening of popular music and variety at London's Chiswick Empire. that night was a host of performers, including the five Dallas boys, Gene and Peter Barber, the stilt dancing puppeteers, and Joe Brown with his brothers. These acts and others performed on what was known as the variety circuit. Some are still famous today. Some don't look much older, but then again, some do. However, our film follows the fortunes of an act who was bottom of the bill that night, Chris and Bobby Whistle a musical novelty act known as The Whistlers. in the box office when I first met the Worcester Brothers and these two pale young men peered in at me and they were very, very white and they had thick hair on their heads like a Brillo pad, curly hair and at first I didn't believe them but that was their act. Yes, that's what they did. They whistled like that and after the show they, I went up to them and they were all ruddy and flush from whistling and I shook them both by the hands and I said, do you know what? That was absolute crap. <laughs> The Whistler Brothers also recorded an interview for Oh Boy, which has never been shown. That was until now, when we can bring you painstakingly reconstructed all that remains of a rare backstage insight into the auricular phenomenon that was the Whistlers. Well, how do you feel, boys? <coughs> well, a bit nervous, I think. Yeah, a bit nervous, sir. A bit nervous. Uh-huh. Uh, tell the viewers at home a little about yourselves. Right, well, I'm Chris, and he's Bobby. Uh, the Whistler Brothers. We whistle popular songs. Well, well, just the one. The what song. <laughs> At the moment. Yes. I see. And uh, do you hope to be as successful as Britain's number one pop throb, Cliff Richard, one day? He doesn't whistle, does he? No, no, Cliff doesn't whistle. No, he sings. I, I don't think he could whistle because of that, that lip thing he does with his lip. I don't remember much about them, really. I remember a couple of very pale lads always standing around backstage. They pulled odd faces, kept doing this with their lips. Everyone wanted the dressing room a long way away from them because when they rehearsed, oh, God, it was awful. The Whistler Brothers' performance that night proved to be a turning point in their careers. This recording, again from the TV show, Oh Boy, was never transmitted. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. We're Chris and Bobby Whistle. The Whistlers. six minutes to get the audience going again. Some of them, their ears was bleeding. I think it was the pitch of that whistling. Well, I told the promoter to go and have a word with them. You see, they thought they went well. Now, one of them was quite relaxed, but the other one, he seemed to slip into this kind of whistling dementia. <laughs> they didn't realise they'd failed? No, you see... The audience was whistling at them to get off. Well, they thought they were just joining in, like harmonising. When do you think they'd realise they'd flopped? Well, when the club manager come round, told them they were a load of rubbish and refused to pay them. They took the hint? Well, probably did. And Chris? Well, he just sort of sat in the corner. 
whistling. Vince Parsons was the promoter that night. Tommy Cockles remembers. Well, he was a lovely man, but he did have a terrible temper. I remember that one night, he went straight to the dressing room and he was very, very angry. Oh, he was livid. And when he got there, he discovered something very strange. Bobby Whistler was just packing up his things, and I think Chris was just visiting the gentleman's cloakroom. But Bobby wasn't whistling. He was making this marvellous humming sound, and it was a very deep, rich, beautiful hum. And you see, that's when everything changed. Show business promoter Vince Parsons signed Bobby up on the spot. He immediately released what was to become the Christmas number one for that year, Humming for Love, and promptly made plans for a 65-day tour of America. Chris Whistle, now left without a partner, became terribly depressed and refused to come out of the dressing room. His whistling was incessant. This film was shot by a daily sketch reporter. Several days later, he emerged, tired and ill-looking, with bloody lips. Holy love. He decided to quit the business altogether and head back to his parents' home in South London. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bobby Whistler was now a huge success in America under the name of Bobby Hummer. He went on to have a string of number one hits with hummed versions of popular tunes like Are You Lonesome Tonight, Cry Me a River, and How Much Is That Doggy in the Window. Now 51 and living in Los Angeles, Bobby looks back on those days with great fondness. They were exciting times, very exciting. Life was like one big long party then. It's a shame about what happened to, um, to, to Chris. I still hum, of course, but it's more behind the scenes nowadays. <laughs> I feel I'm a bit too old for all this teenage stuff. Now, I do a lot of work for the major film companies, Universal, Columbia, Warner, Touchstone, Troma, you know. Jaws 4, take one. Chris Russell is now a taxi driver and still lives in South London. Oh, yes. I mean, to begin with, I was, I was quite devastated, you know. It's turned out all right, I suppose. <coughs> I'm not bitter about Bob anymore. Not at all. Uh, no, he's... Hollywood's a tough nut and he's cracked it. Oh, I wish him all the best. I just wish, really, <coughs> he hadn't, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I wish he hadn't changed his name. I've always seen uh, humming as the poor cousin to whistling, you know. <coughs> Still, I've got a customer, so I'd better go. <coughs> Thanks very much. and Bobby. For a brief period towards the end of that iconoclastic decade known as the 50s, they were the princes of the Palace of Whistling. Finally, we asked their peers to sum up their legacy. They were crap. Crap, definitely. They were really nice boys, but crap, yes. <laughs> Was it my